Welcome back. So yes, mini PCs, I am still gonna be reviewing more of them in the channel, ones I can get hold of. So this one from Heistu was sent out to me in exchange for this review. So what it is, is a gaming mini PC from them. It has a little bit of power. It's decent, the GTX 1650. It's not top end, but it's a dedicated GPU that is sufficient enough to play modern titles with say medium settings, or depending on how demanding it is, or lower settings, but still all 1080p with good frame rates. Now this particular model has the Core i7-9750H. It also has up to two displays out. It's got a Type-C put on the rear that I thought might have been or supported Thunderbolt 3, sadly doesn't, or even display out. Now this being a bare bones mini PC means that we do need to supply RAM, an SSD, and an operating system for this. So this is what you will find inside the box. We've got an adapter here. This is for our SATA 3 drive, if you're going to be installing one 2.5 inches, and then our SATA 3 cable, the SATA 3 power cable, get some screws, EU plug. So it is using that Mickey Mouse style plug, as you can see. And this is a very easy one to source. So if it's not the correct connector for you, just get a new cable. Now the power supply, very large because it is 150 watts. And this one is made by Delta Electronics. So this is a known brand here. So it should be reliable. They also do include in the box a driver CD right here. So that has all the drivers we need for this particular gaming mini PC. And then a high stew mouse mat. So the underside here, we've got four solid rubber feet and the screws right here, there are four of them to screw this lid in place, aren't there. They were in the box separate because we need to install our components, of course, because this is a bare bones. And I do believe you can buy it from them pre-configured with RAM and an SSC as well, but I've got my own components that I have already installed here. So you can see I've got two sticks here of 16 gigabyte. This is DDR4 from Crucial. 2,666 megahertz, and my SSD from Sabrent is two terabytes, this one here, it's MVME. So we've got the SATA 3 connector right here for data and power. If you're gonna be installing a 2.5 inch drive, and that would go right here in this space. But of course, it's not there, most of those components, because we need to get that RAM in. Now, this SODIMM right here was a little difficult to actually get in. You have to slot it in at a funny angle and then push it in and we don't have to remove this at least, the two blowers there we've got. So these um, coolers right here, they're basically a gaming laptop's cooler. Both of them you'll hear later on in this video, I'll give you a sample of these fans. And that they do turn off, which is good when it's under idle, not under load, these fans will be off. But when they're on, it does turn into a bit of a hairdryer. And that's probably the biggest con of this particular unit right here, that the fan noise can be a little bit loud, especially when you're pushing it hard. So you can see all of the components nicely laid out in here. There's a little bit of space, but it's pretty cramped in there. You can only see a bit of space just down here that is free. And good quality, the motherboard, the components, it all looks fine. I can't see any areas where they've cut corners, so that is good. I'll show you the rest of the design now of this mini PC. So this is the front of it. There are no USB ports on the front or a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, just our power button. There are some status LEDs behind this that are white that will light this up. And then when you take a look at the top of it, there also, this area along here does light up red. So there's a tiny bit of a red accent with some red LED lights just along inside the strip here. You can see their branding is there as well. So this part looks like carbon fiber. It's quite well done, but it's not actually carbon fiber. It's just plastic with that texture on it. So this part here is made out of an alloy and the build quality is reasonable. So on the, if you're looking at the front of it, on the right hand side here at the top, that is where we have our exit vent, okay? So this is where all that hot air is coming out and you can see it's very large and it definitely does push that hot air out. And we'll be looking at thermals later on in this detailed in-depth review. And then on the left side, that is, well, that's really just an intake there. And again, with the red accent, not to mistake this for being anything but a gaming mini PC, of course. And then on the back, this is where we have all of our ports here. So we've got the DC in, of course, to power it. Now this, it looks like it's gonna be a full spec Type-C port, USB 3.1, which apparently it is, but I'm not actually getting any video signal out of this whatsoever. When I tried to do it with Windows, I've got all their drivers installed as well. It gives me an error, so I don't think it actually works. Display port, so this does support 4K 60 Hertz. HDMI, I think this is HDMI 1.4 because I'm not able to get 4K 60 Hertz out of this one, which that is kind of disappointing. So if you want the 4K 60, 
you have to use the display port. Now you can use a display port to HDMI adapter. There's some of them out there, of course, that you can buy that will work. Two USB two ports, four USB 3.0 gigabit LAN there, and then we have the 3.5 millimeter that does support microphones as well, this one. So it's basically like a laptop port. Of course, the internals in this are really laptop internals, but in a mini PC. So you should be able to see just through these fans, there are actually three copper thermal transfer heat pipes that are going over the top of the GPU and our CPU here. And that is then transferring that heat onto the back right here, getting blown out. And I'll focus on those thermals too in this video, of course. And I even use my thermal imaging camera so we can see just where the hot points are. So this BIOS is completely unlocked to us, which is great. We've got all the conceivable options you can think of with a BIOS here, apart from one that I haven't been able to find. Now it could be in here, I just can't find it, and that is if it detects a power off state, it regains power, if it can then automatically power itself back on. For server use, for example, or you wanna put it on a switch, not that you would with a dedicated GPU, this particular mini PC, can't find it. But this one is very interesting, the overclocking performance menu that you do have to enable. You gotta find it in there first to get all these settings. And it does let us undervolt without having to use, for example, Intel's XTU. So for the processor, I have done a bit of an undervolt here. So just 0 0.090 and the offset of course is a negative. And that means we don't need to use XTU. It's all done through the BIOS and you can undervolt everything there. Now the memory is the handy one to look at because I am running faster RAM here than say 2.4 gigahertz. This is 2.66. And in order to get those speeds, I did have to go here to the memory profile. So clicking on that, we can then enable the XMP Profile 1. Without it, it uses the default profile, which is a slower RAM speed for my particular RAM I have installed. So once that is all set, of course you need to save and exit, and you can boot from here too, change your boot order, all your standard kind of things there, but uh, let's save and exit and jump into Windows. So it didn't take me too long to get set up in Windows. All of the drivers will come through from Windows 10 update. I went onto NVIDIA's website as well, installed the latest GTX 1650 driver, and I've got all the Intel drivers as well for the wireless AC and for the graphics. So switchable graphics on this particular model, but for the purposes of this review, and I think most people might actually do that, I've forced uh, all of the graphics to be on the NVIDIA card here, the most powerful one. After all, we wanna see the best performance, don't we? So the wireless card that I didn't actually show when we looked at the internals because the SSD was blocking it, but underneath that SSD is the dual band wireless AC3165. Now the maximum throughput is, it's kind of slow for 2020 definitely, 390 megabits per second. I mean, that might be okay for some people's networks, but if you're doing large file transfers, I recommend to upgrade this to the Intel AX200, which is Wi-Fi 6 you get much better performance. So you will see the processor listed here 12 times, of course, because the Coffee Lake Core i7, the 9750H, does have six cores, but the 12 threads there. And this is why performance, as you'll see soon, is quite good on this one. It's no slouch whatsoever. Windows is running fantastic. Feels just as fast as my desktop. So that GPU, just wanted to point out here that we do have the Samsung RAM. Now, I normally see often Hynix RAM, and in my experience, overclocking the Hynix, you can never overclock it as good as the Samsung RAM there. So that has boosted the little bit of bandwidth here. Actually, it's gone up quite a bit. So you get the four gigabytes of DDR5 RAM, which is decent enough and an okay kind of performance as you see later on. I will test some games as well. So just to point out that using uh, MSI's Afterburn, you can use other tools as well. I have overclocked the GPU here a little bit. And I talk a bit about the differences you can expect. What this is basically doing this 750 megahertz I've added to the memory clock. And then the core clock, well, this doesn't really do much at all, the core clock. It's giving me about an 8% boost for nothing, okay? And it doesn't raise the temperatures, maybe one degree. It doesn't really seem to have any impact whatsoever. So that's why I say, go and do it, overclock, and also undervolt this CPU as well for maximum performance which I have done here. So before we get onto these benchmarks, I'll just point that out, that I have undervolted uh, 0 0.090, okay? Uh, why I have done this? Because I know a lot of people are starting to do this, and there were some comments in my previous Intel reviews that I should have undervolted, and a lot of people were not too happy about that, so I've done it here. 
Now, this was just me experimenting, okay? You can increase the power limit because you will run into some, uh, not, well, actually, you do hit thermal throttling, but more, more on the thermals later on. And I've done this only just as a quick test to see if it helps out the performance. It does a little bit. Keep it on the stock here. That is normally actually uh, 45 watts, but I just wanted to point that out there. So all the tests that I have shown you, apart from this first one here, sorry, which is this, uh, that was stock, okay? Stock with the graphics core, and of course I do have the faster RAM there. So you're getting 9,320 with PC Mark, sorry, 3D Mark Fire Strike. And when you overclock, there's that about approximately 8% difference boost we get on the graphics core, score, sorry. And the physics score, very good here. So over 16,000 for this particular chip with the 4.5 gigahertz max turbo, really, really good. So this is a very powerful mini PC especially for the size of it, it's doing really well. Geekbench 5 score, again, very good. The multi-core score here breaking over the 6,000 mark. That is great. And here is Geekbench 4. So you can see there, very good score. Now, last one is PC Mark 10. So if you want to compare this to your own tech at home, your old mini PC, your desktop, run these benchmarks and see if it's any better because it might not actually be better. Cinebench R15, very good score over... 1200 CB, really good. And Cinebench R20 as well. This one, again, very good. So it's under 3000 points. Now the last laptop tech you could say, or last laptop reviewed was a Rumi Book 16 and that has the Ryzen 7. And that gets a score that is really only about, what, 50 points more than this. And it's only eight cores though. That shows you how good the Ryzen's are, the new ones. And considering this has the 12 threads, that is only eight Eight cores, it's doing really well. Seven nanometer chip as well. This one isn't. So the performances mentioned is super, super quick. There's no point me doing the office document tests and things like that. On the lower end tech, I do it, but I won't here. But I will just show you some video files. So very demanding jellyfish sample file, 140 megabits per second, 4K, 10 bit. Really smooth. At the beginning, there's a few little stutters, but now that is a solid 30 frames per second. And not a problem. And what about if I step it up? 4K60. Very, very smooth. This is the Sony Swordsmith file. And so any video files you throw at it, it'll play them and handle them with ease. Not a problem with this particular mini PC. Now on to 4K video editing. And this one is going to surprise you. And they've got some updates that I have downloaded. The latest version, of course, of Adobe Premium Pro that I am running. And the timeline is just so smooth. So I've got the playback video resolution here on half, but really it handles it on full just fine. Now it's all looked, looks a little bit crammed in here because I've got the scaling of Windows set to 150% so we can see everything a little bit clearer on your mobile phones and tablets or whatever you're watching this on. So that is, that's live, okay? That is real time, sorry. This is coming through the playback super quick, really fast. So I do have my a little timer here. And I'm going to just reset this and we'll see what kind of speeds we're going to be looking at here in terms of exports because this, I'm doing this a second take now because I just don't believe how fast this is. This is absolutely ridiculous. So I always test out the YouTube 4K preset, which it is right here. And I'm going to need about one minute of footage, closest I can get it to, of course. And we'll see just how this is going to perform. But I am stunned with these updates and just the power of this that I'm able to get these kind of speeds. So that is almost, even if it's just a fraction over, that's one second, two seconds over. And I'll make sure that this is being exported to the desktop. Okay. Saved on the desktop here. And let's hit export before I time this. So hit start there, export, one second delay. And look at this. This is just insane. Look how fast this is. One minute of 4K footage is going to be finished. Finish up here. And look at this. This, this is just crazy. 21 seconds. Maybe 22. Factor in my delay. And it was two seconds more of footage. That's insane. I've never seen these kind of speeds before. I'm blown away by this. Now, what was doing most of the work here? So if we have a look, the CPU was about half, um, up to 80% I saw on the GTX 1650. 
and also the UHD graphics. So Adobe Premiere Pro is exporting using both of our GPUs. So the dedicated GPU and that integrated, and that is just why it is so blazing fast. That is just marvelous, the performance now we are getting out of, well, this kind of tech to export 4K video so quick. So I've got GTA 5 here on the highest settings possible. I have added also the population density and the diversity and the viewing distance to all be set to maximum. And the frame rate is normally the whole time over 100 frames per second average, which is really good. So this is excellent performance considering, well, the GTX 1650 is not exactly high end. It's more of a low end dedicated GPU, but it does quite well, especially with my little overclock there. Now you can see the clocks, they're about 1800, always normally in the 1800 megahertz range there with our GPU. And the temperatures on that GPU are very, very good. So it normally sits at about 59 degrees, 60 degrees, and doesn't really go over that. CPU, when gaming, is always in the mid 70s to late 70s, which again is also fine. So great performance here, good thermals, Let's have a look now at another game. This title here is Resident Evil 2, and I'm seeing a frame rate that is normally over 70 frames per second the whole time. This is very good performance considering the GPU we've got with this one. And this is on the balanced settings, if you're wondering, which is uh, still graphically looks pretty good, as you can see. And I'm a very poor aim. So this next title, this is Tomb Raider, the Shadow of Tomb Raider, and I've got it set to the medium preset. And I'll show you the result of, this is the in-game benchmark, and it gives a good rating on whether or not the medium preset is going to be too demanding, but you can see it's at the moment 60 frames per second, but let's take a look at the end result. And this is the end result, so very good, I think, 63 frames per second on average for the medium preset. This is a demanding game after all. So Call of Duty Modern Warfare, this one is running well on 1080p, full 1080p scaling. And I have it set to the normal settings, if that makes sense. The default ones that they recommend. So this is not on the ultra high settings or anything like that. And the frame rate is normally between somewhere about 65 to 100 frames per second, depending on where you are. And this is good. So looking down the scope and things, there is no noticeable big lag or stutters that are going to get you killed. So very good performance here. Thermals are still good. The fan is constantly running in the background, and it sounds very similar to that of, say, just having a gaming laptop running. You probably have about the same disbells coming through that too as well. So great performance here. I'm pleased with the gaming performance. So with my wall meter, I'm seeing about 45, 46, 47 or so watts. This is with the dedicated GPU on. If you're using switchable graphics and it's then on the Intel, it will be a little bit less. The maximum load, this is a full stress test that I'm doing, so that will be the GPU being worked to the maximum and the CPU. I'm then seeing 141 watts. That is just within the 150 watts that this power supply can put out maximum. So we are safe there. And what about the fan noise? So this is the, the con of this particular one. When it is idle, the fan will turn off when below 50 degrees. That is good, not a problem. But as soon as it goes over, the fan comes on. It does step up in different RPMs. When it is on the maximum and being stressed, 100% RPMs, 100% load, it's loud. It sounds like a bit of a hair dryer. Here is a sample of it at 100% load being stressed out to the max. Lastly, thermal. So the internal temperatures, I'm seeing 90 degrees maximum on the CPU, and that does trigger thermal throttling. It only happens for a split second. Then once the fan hits the 100% RPM, it will then be in the mid 80s. Normally when gaming, it doesn't normally get in the mid 80s either. Now you can see when looking at with my thermal camera here, imaging camera, that it does get a little bit warm, but these coolers do actually push out a lot of hot air. So you can even see around where the coolers are spinning, the actual fans, that it is cooler the air inside there. So it's doing its job sucking in the cooler air. This is even with the lid on. I've just taken the lid off now so you can see it here. Now, what is the hottest point there? That is the chipset, of course. It doesn't have a fan on it, and it's getting up to around 56 degrees then. That is kind of normal, though, for the chipsets to get hot. It does have a heatsink on it. So I think the thermals, they're actually good, apart from that split-second spike to 90 degrees.
What about Linux compatibility? So there is no problems running the latest distros out there. This is Linux Mint that I am running and I didn't run into any issues. So the current wireless card is detected just fine with the built-in drivers there. Now, if you use something a little bit newer, then perhaps you could run into a problem with that, but it's just all about hunting down the drivers, finding, of course, the best and latest distros that you like, personal preference, and they all just run fine. And of course, really good performance. This hardware running something as light as Linux, it just absolutely flies. Now, speaking about that fan noise, that is the biggest con with this particular one here, that it sounds like a MSI gaming laptop when you put it into that Windforce mode or the turbo fan cooling mode, that it gets up to 52 decibels, which is rather loud. Now, that's not gonna be happening all the time. In some games, it will vary, that fan will fluctuate. It'll be around 70% RPM, and then the decibels are like 40, two, three, and it's bearable, it's not too bad then, like a normal kind of gaming laptop. Now the fan, thankfully, does turn off when not doing anything demanding. But now and then you hear it roar into action, and then half a minute later, turn off. And that is kind of a little bit annoying. So the con, definitely the fan noise isn't amazing. The other thing too, I thought that this would have display out on the Type-C port at least, but it doesn't, sadly. So, and also does not support Thunderbolt on that port. So, ah, that's another con there. And then the HDMI port is only HDMI 1.4A spec, which in 2020, come on, that should be HDMI 2A, at least, that this GPU is able to put out. So in terms of performance, that is where it does impress. And that encoding speed, Export time for 4K video blew me away, just wow. Okay, well, what was it, 22 seconds? Okay, that's from the updates from Adobe themselves. It's also because it was using both of the GPUs. So the dedicated GPU and the integrated GPU meant that it just powered through one minute of footage to do it in a record setting time there for me in my test. Now, normally I see around maybe one minute or over one minute. It has now got to that level that that's kind of on par with my desktop PC, which is water cooled and overclocked to five gigahertz. And this thing really does go well. So all your latest titles, all the games out there, I only showed you a few examples. So I didn't want to make the, the video, this review like 30 minutes long, uh, that it will play all the latest titles. Just lower the settings to medium and you're gonna have a very playable frame rate at 1080p. So that's Call of Duty was running just fine there. And Resident Evil 2, for example, all games that uh, are moderately demanding and even Tomb Raider, the shadow of Tomb Raider, Perfectly fine there. Just tweak the settings a little bit to your personal preference just to get that balance between visuals, of course, and frame rate. So overall, it is a good mini PC. It's selling for about 700 US dollars for the base configuration with a slightly slower main CPU. And I think that that's okay. And I know people are gonna say, well, why don't you just buy a laptop that's got that same spec? You can get this deal or that deal. It's of course, that is an option there, but this is, Something like a little niche market here. A lot of people just want to connect a mini PC that's relatively small, smaller than say a big gaming laptop up into a huge big screen or a large monitor. You've got your keyboard. You've got your favorite RGB backlit mechanical keyboard. You don't want a laptop. Then something like this is an option as a maybe secondary PC or you can put your used laptop parts into this and turn this into a gaming PC. You don't have to buy this extra. So yes, when you factor in the RAM, the SSD, if you don't have those components, that does, of course, again, guys in the comments, yes, push the price up to probably about a thousand US dollars or 900, where yes, you could get a laptop. I hear that, I know that, but this is a mini PC that is a laptop, you know, they're all different. So thank you so much for watching. I will have more mini PC reviews up and coming. The next two will be AMD ones. I have, one of them's gonna have the Ryzen 3400G with Vega 11 graphics. So it won't be quite as powerful in gaming performance as this one, but it's a different option there and there'll be another AMD as well. So I hope to see you back in the channel for those reviews of more up and coming mini PCs. Bye for now.